morning, today, we are going to take a deep dive into our mental constructs about God. And I'm sure that most of us here have done that, but if you're like me, you can't do it too many times. Every time it's a new exploration because every time in this humanness, we are in a different situation, a different place in our evolution. So I extend the invitation to you with these ideas in mind. I extend the invitation for you to be open at the top. I extend the invitation for you to allow a flow of the divine ideas to just kind of ripple through you and to actually trust yourself completely to capture the ideas that resonate within you. And finally, I invite you to consider what limitations and restrictions you may be placing on your experiences today because of previously formed mental constructs. Are you ready to let go now of mental constructs that hold you back from your good? Are you ready to experience the power, the beauty, the presence, the peace, the love, the wisdom, the joy, and the abundance that resides as you? So this morning, our title is In God, With God, Of God. And you were each given, if you wanted one, a Raisin Bran muffin this morning. And the muffin has meaning because <laughs> our talk is based upon a quote by Eric Butterworth. Eric Butterworth said this, We are not in God. We are not a raisin in a muffin. And then he said, we are not with God as separate beings walking hand in hand through life. Yes. <laughs> We're still one. That's the point. He goes on and he says, we are of God, individuated expressions of the one. So we are made of God's stuff. In God, with God, of God. I think we could call our talk the power of prepositions. <laughs> yeah. And here's, an, here's the thing, you know, in and of themselves, prepositions have no power. Did you catch on to that? In and of themselves, prepositions have no meaning. Unless there is an object to the preposition, there is no meaning in the preposition at all. There is power in preposition in terms of de defining direction. Um, and for, particularly for us, um, mentally, in terms of defining our direction, in terms of what, where our, our thoughts are going, what is the direction of our general idea of our thoughts. And it's also an idea of where are we directing our thoughts in terms of where are we putting energy into the law and having it manifest in our lives. Where are we directing our thoughts to go and how are they actually producing accordingly? In this case, um, a preposition determines a greater, deeper meaning in our lives. In, of, with, for, by, etc. Where we put those words and how we use them and relate to them is really important. I think the problem is when our prepositions become propositions. Mm -hmm. Propositions are statements that um, create our, our are based on a, what we believe to be a truth, and they, they, they propose a, a basic idea of truth, and uh, they propose what we consider to be a valid theory, so therefore it's a reality in our lives. And so, um, I think it's important that we remember that our propositions are separate from prepositions, or the prepositions are very powerful in terms of how we choose to use them and what we say, and um, what we say is actually what we quite often experience. 
Ernest Holmes says, the spirit is both an overdwelling and an indwelling presence. We are immersed in it, and it flows through us as our very being. Within us is the unborn possibility of limitless experience. Ours is the privilege of giving birth to it. So you can see as our thoughts create, we need to be careful about what our thoughts really are. So David said some of these, but I'm going to restate some of them too. And you may have think of some others that we didn't. But what I'd like you to do as I share these different prepositions is just kind of look at where you've heard them, if you use them, how you use them, and what they mean for you. Because the meaning is really relevant, how we take these ideas in. So the first one, I just have to say something about it. I know I didn't in practice, but every time it comes to me, by God. Now, in my household, my dad would say, by God. And he wasn't really talking about anything except demonstrating his anger. Now, could I have a mental construct around that idea, those words? Absolutely. And if I do, that's my business to either take care of or not. Because each of us has our own. So here are some others. Through God, from God, for God. Now I know some of those often get used as a statement to show why karma is coming and you're <laughs> going to get punished because this is coming from God. <laughs> we don't believe that. I don't believe that. But do we? Let's look at, dig up some mental constructs within ourselves to determine if and what we really believe. Robert Anderson wrote a song. He's in a team called Devotion. And the choir used to sing it sometimes. It was to me, by me, through me, of me. And the words that he had in the song were, this comes through me, this could be by me, this was never done to me, this is of me. So pretty powerful words that we're speaking. How about the idea of to God? The thing that comes to mind for me is from my mouth to God's ears. And I actually like that quote, even though the to God is insinuating there's something outside of you. For me, it doesn't have to be. And each of us has to decide for themselves. For me, that means that whatever comes out of my mouth or stays in my mouth, but is a thought or a word, is within me, and God, law, love, within me, responds and says yes to whatever that is. And remember that anything we create that we've decided now we don't want, we can recreate. It doesn't have to stay one particular way. Under God, we've probably all said that when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, it says one nation under God indivisible. Well, some people believe that when they say that, they're talking about somebody up in the sky speaking down to them. I don't particularly believe that. I still say the Pledge of Allegiance, but when I say it, I am not just unifying the nation, but globally, all people. But when I'm thinking it in that saying the pledge, I'm thinking of the nation being united and claiming to be one nation under the power and the presence of that indivisible unity of all life, of one life. A really good one to use is as God. And that can get a little uncomfortable if you haven't used it or aren't familiar with it. But I am doing what I am doing as God. Because all that is is God, so I must be. And so, because all that is is God and I must be, if I am knowing that I live as God, might I live a little more intentionally? Might I become a little bit more aware of 
the choices that I'm making, the words that I'm speaking, the body language that I'm sharing with others, the behaviors that I have, I might become a little bit more intentional so that I can truly allow God to live itself as me in a way that is recognizable to our mental construct of what God is. I also really love the words wrapped in the arms of God. Again, I don't believe God has physical arms except as you and me, and I love being wrapped in everyone's God arms. It feels good, and I love thinking about being wrapped in the arms of God. For me, it feels very safe, very comfortable, very supported, and it's a great way to fall asleep <laughs> for me. We have a saying in Science of Mind we use quite often, particularly in terms of uh, spiritual mind treatment and affirmative uh, thought, and it is to have the faith of God, not the faith in God. Because we know that God is all that is, and so therefore if we are, we, all we are is God. And so therefore we have access, immediate access, to all the power and presence that there is. So we don't have to rely on God the Big Brother to do things for us, or God the Father to do things for us, because we have the power, we are the power. And so therefore we have faith of God, not reliance upon God. Eric Bugger says it similarly, he says, the idea is not believing in, but leave believing from. We believe from the truth of who we are and the greater, higher self. Spirit flows through me, in me, to me. It expresses around me and as me. It is basically all that I am and everything around me. The more we immerse ourselves in spirit through spiritual practice and intentional consciousness training, the more we live in a sense of oneness and things begin to fall into order, or actually, more accurately, um, we begin to recognize the order. And we recognize our place in it, or maybe more accurately, we recognize our place as it. Catch all the prepositions and all that? <laughs> Here's a diagram that I think kind of explains it. Suppose this is God. Okay, we know that a circle is not really an accurate definition of God because it's that God has no boundaries or um, parameters, but a circle represents infinity and eternality, so therefore we're going to say, this is God. Empedocles says, the nature of God is a circle which the center is everywhere and the circumference is nowhere. So the question we have to think about, well, where do we fit into that allness of all that is? Because I know that I'm not all that is, although at different uh, holiday times that appear to be more of all that is, but I know that I'm not really all that is. So how do we start looking at our relationship to that which is all that is? Quite often in traditional uh, spiritual religions we have the idea that God is so is beyond, God is the white bearded man on the cloud separate from us and we must pray to God and worship God and honor God, but we can never really have a conversation with God and science of mind, of course, doesn't believe that. But we believe that God is so much bigger than us and so much greater than us that we can never really approach it. In fact, if we were to approach it, it would blow our minds and we would, we would cease to be. So how exactly do we communicate with that? Um, we know that God is um, all that is, and we quite often look at the term the Father, the higher good, whatever. And we think of God as the source of all that is, the abundance of all that is. And so therefore we ask God out of its wealth and abundance to give us stuff that we need. So we can ask God for, you know, can I borrow the car keys or <laughs> better yet, can I borrow the credit card? Because God is the source of abundance. God is all that is. And so that God has the ability to give to us. And that's if you're in separation thinking, Yes, right? that's dualistic thinking. They, God is separate from me. The next one is... We're going to make that relationship a little bit closer. It's God in me. I feel the rec and recognize the uh, presence within myself. I'm interconnected with God. I feel the essence of energy flowing in me. And so therefore, I feel I'm actually literally connected to God. 
Of course, we're still separate entities, but we are interconnected. That's a different way. To get a little closer way of looking at it, the next one is God moving, expressing through me. I'm an open of myself to the and try to be a clear channel, knowing that I'm an instrument of divine energy, and God flows through me. So I try to open myself up to allow divine energy to flow through me. I'm still a separate entity because God is not really me yet because God is actually flowing through me. So the most that I can do to open myself to be a clear channel is beneficial both to me and to God. And of course the next one is God as me. Showing up in the world as me. God expresses as me my individual and um, independent self is an expression of God. So although I appear to be individualized, I am nothing but God energy flowing into the world as me. Ernest Holmes says, we are immersed in it and it flows through us as our very being. In times of challenge, we kind of often feel like that separation starts to get occur and we begin to feel maybe God is just moving through me or sometimes I feel like God and I are separate. The truth is, and what we believe in science of mind is, we are always one entity. And when we practice, I didn't see your tie, but the last one is the one that we want to be oh, in. Cool. And if you really want to blow your mind, <laughs> let the tie be God, and you're all of it. You're right there with all of it. You can go anywhere you want to. I like that. <laughs> We'll have to hang that out where we can see it instead of in the closet. <laughs> so, um, honestly, the preposition or the word that we use for me doesn't really matter much at all. What matters is the mental construct that I attach with the word that I choose. In Science of Mind, you will very often bump up against someone who you say, oh, I think God uh, did this through me, and they'll say, oh, you mean as you. We love to fix each other in this teaching, but there's truly nothing to fix, because your word for through and my word for as may mean totally different things, and that's okay. Maybe the same thing. They may. It all has to do with our experiences in life and how we got to where we have gotten. So the mental connection that we make with our words relates to the beliefs that we hold. And those beliefs that we hold are dominant ideas within us. And that is creative. Our dominant thoughts are creative. So how these prepositions show up within your mental construct are really important. So I came up with a way to apply it without getting personal at all. So I'm sure that, you know, when we talk about things, you're probably thinking about your own life. At least I know I always do when I'm listening to a talk. My own life, because I'm the only one I can really do. I'm not thinking about, oh, my kids. That would be really good for my kids to know. Although that might come through sometimes, or a friend, and you can share an idea with them, but the only one you can really do is you. So getting really clear with our own thinking is valuable. So see if any of this rings true for you. Let's look at the idea of a gymnast on a balance beam. First of all, a balance beam is about four inches wide. And most of our feet are less or about four inches wide. So why would we be concerned walking on a balance beam when we aren't concerned walking on a floor? So let's look at situations in our life and our spiritual practices and where we feel we could grow a little bit more using ideas that people that walk the balance beam use. 
The first one is to focus. Focus on your posture. Fo focus on be having a tall, straight back with your shoulders back and your chest up. And next, your eyes up. This one especially made me chuckle because I know when I get out of the shower and I go to wipe my feet, what I'm thinking about matters every single day. If I think, if I go to wipe my feet and I think to myself, okay, I'm gonna balance on one foot, so I'm gonna think about the ceiling, I'm gonna think about the little flower decorations I have up around the top, I can wipe my foot, bend right over, wipe my foot, and I have no problem. But if I just think, okay, I'm gonna wipe my foot. I always get off balance when I do that. And I look down at my feet. Sure enough, I have to lean against the wall to wipe my feet. Now you probably have ideas like that in your own life where you know that if you think one certain way, it happens. And if you think the other certain way, that happens. That's law in action according to our own thought. When I'm thinking up, like the gymnast, keep your eyes up, don't look at the beam, don't look at your feet, look outward, look forward where you're intending. When I think that direction, I stay there. And I'm sure that all of us have to do in our own ways with what works for us. The next one is to engage your core your core, your center, your godness. And then to practice. So people that walk the balance beam don't usually just jump up there unless they're really young and they don't have any concerns with it. They just want to go up there and do it. And they just walk up and do it because their mindset doesn't tell them, oh, you can't do that. Hopefully no one else told them, oh, you might fall and get hurt, <laughs> right? So. We want to tell ourselves, you're not going to fall. You're not going to get hurt. We want to eliminate that. That's that separation thinking. You're God, you've got this. Whatever this is, for each one of us, we've got it. And the path can be made clear as we practice and some other ideas, deep breaths. Who knew gymnasts are up there taking the time to breathe when they're doing all those activities. They are trained to stay calm, to focus, and to be aware of their breath. Our breath leads us into a higher level of thinking. And then finally, to visualize success, always and forever, to visualize the perfect outcome and to know it so specifically, so clearly, so positively that you absolutely know it's going to manifest until the day that you say, oh my gosh, it manifested, it's here, I knew it. <laughs> so when we were looking at this topic, I thought it might be interesting to look up and see what, what other things Eric Butterworth had to say about it, because I'm sure he talks about more than just muffins and raisins. <laughs> And he said some fascinating things. He said, this, things may happen around you and things may happen to you, but the only things that really matter are the things that happen in you. Because God can only do for you what God can do through you. He also said, religious teachings and teachers have conditioned us to think of faith as a magic catalyst that makes God work for us. In no way does faith make God work nor does it release some kind of miracle power. Faith simply tunes into and turns on the divine flow that has always been present. And he says, when enough people get this training and develop the ability to see from God consciousness and to project this consciousness by seeing the depth in every experience and dealing with the highest in everyone, then we will soon begin to progressively unfold the millennium of heaven on earth. I love that, seeing the highest in everyone. You know, as a school teacher, we are trained to teach to the top. You're trained to always hold that bar just above each person's, each child's head so that they can rise to it. 
and when they rise to it, feel that success, but move that bar a little bit higher. And that's kind of like life. So we're going to end today with an Ernest Holmes quote that speaks to this very topic, of course, with all the wisdom that there is. In all the kingdoms that exist, in all the planes that exist, and deep within the self, hidden and yet felt, there is a high priest, and when he's talking about a high priest, he's using the idea of an archetype, not a person, an archetype of wisdom, an archetype of God that is within us, the quality of God as wisdom and law. He says, there is a high priest ready to conduct us to the sacred and secret chamber of the self where God and man are one. And what he means by that last part is that within ourselves, we as humanity can absolutely know oneness. I don't believe that, that mind-blowing thing David was talking about that some people believe. I do believe absolutely that we can and do very often know all that God is. I do believe that. Some people don't. Some people do. It's a personal thing. It's about your personal relationship with God. Holmes goes on to say, the search for union passes into the realization, not that we are just with or in, but that we are of God. One with or one in implies separation. The great realization is that we are of that which is. The aim of our search is to discover that the universe is individualized in each one of us.